Wilbur Wright once said, the desire to fly is an idea handed down to us by our ancestors, who in their grueling travels across trackless lands in prehistoric times, looked enviously on the birds soaring freely through space at full speed above all obstacles on the infinite highway of the air. Technically, the word sky means everything that lies above the earth, yet when pondering the sky, it is that space which evokes a sense of freedom, wonder, and infinity. It is open and vast, and in mythology and religion, it is the place reserved for deities and the place that our soul travels towards after death. For man to be in the sky, the physical laws of gravity must be overcome, along with having the correct balance to account for the forces of weight, lift, drag, and thrust. The first real study of flight began in the 1480s when Leonardo da Vinci began creating concept drawings to illustrate his theory on flight. While never actually created, da Vinci's ornithopter flying machine became the concept upon which the modern-day helicopter is based. In 1783, the Montgolfier brothers invented the first hot air balloon by blowing smoke from a fire into a silk bag, and from 1799 to 1850, George Calais made extensive strides in glider innovation, where he also theorized that a fixed-wing aircraft with a power system for propulsion and a tail assist to control the aircraft would be the best method to allow man to fly. In 1891, Otto Lilienthal, expanding on theories of glider aerodynamics, was the first person to design a glider that could fly a person over long distances. Known as the Flying Man, Lilienthal completed over 2,500 flights in his glider until he was killed when strong winds caused him to crash into the ground in August of 1896. Building on the works of Cayley and Lilienthal, Orville and Wilbur Wright two brothers who owned a bicycle repair and sales shop, began tinkering with their own theories on aerodynamics, starting first with gliders. In 1903, the brothers added power to their glider in the form of propellers and a 12 horsepower gas engine. The brothers named their plane the Wright Flyer, and on December 17, 1903, the brothers succeeded in flying the first free controlled flight of a power-driven heavier than air plane for 59 seconds over a distance of 852 feet. In October of 1905, the brothers, flying a plane called the Flyer 3, flew for 39 minutes for a distance of 24 miles, which demonstrated that humankind now had the understanding of flight. By 1914, planes were used in World War I. By the 1930s, the U.S. had airlines delivering passengers across the country and by the 1940s across the world. The 1950s saw the birth of the first jet engine and by 1969, a man was walking on the moon. However, mankind's attempt to slip the surly bonds of Earth have not been without consequences as inventors, pilots, and in some cases passengers have perished in flying-related accidents. While all are tragic, there are several aviation accidents that are mysterious, not for their cause, but for the haunting legends which have originated from their aftermath. Born in 1897 in Atchison, Kansas, Amelia Earhart started her flying career in her early 20s. By 1921, she had purchased her first airplane, and by October 1922, she had set her first of many records when she flew her plane at an altitude of 14,000 feet, setting a world record for female pilots. In 1928, as a passenger, she became the first woman to fly across the Atlantic, returning to New York as a hero. In 1932, Earhart became the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic and the first woman to fly solo from coast to coast in the U.S. In 1935, she became the first person to fly solo from Hawaii to California. During all of her aviation exploits, which propelled her to be labeled Queen of the Air, Amelia Earhart was also a vocal proponent of women's rights, advocating that more women were needed in science fields and that a woman was just as capable as a man in the field of aviation. 
See, there is a place within the industry itself for women who work. While still greatly outnumbered, they are finding more and more opportunities for employment in the ranks of this latest transportation medium. May I hope this movement will spread throughout all branches of applied science and industry, and that women may come to share with men the joy of doing. Those can appreciate rewards most who have helped create. In 1935, Purdue University President Edward C. Elliott was seeking a way to increase female enrollment at the university. Due to her advocacy of women, Elliott invited Earhart to join the faculty as a consultant in the Women's Career Department at Purdue, as well as become an advisor in Purdue's Department of Aeronautics. Earhart fully embraced her role at Purdue, and she became a great source of encouragement for women seeking careers in technology and science. Earhart also spent a significant amount of time in Hangar No. 1 at the Purdue University Airport, which was the first university-owned and operated airport in the country. Despite her newfound roles at Purdue, in 1936, Amelia Earhart decided that she had one last grand flying adventure that she wanted to pursue. She wanted to be the first to fly around the world at the equator. In April of 1936, an Amelia Earhart Fund for Aeronautical Research was created with the Purdue Research Foundation, and that fund purchased the $80,000 Lockheed Electra aircraft that Earhart would use in her flight. This plane, which spent months at Hangar No. 1 at Purdue University, was to be a flying laboratory in which Earhart would conduct experiments for Purdue as she flew around the world. On June 1, 1937, Amelia Earhart and her navigator, Fred Noonan, departed from Miami, Florida to attempt the flight. By June 29th, they had flown 22,000 miles of the 29,000-mile journey. One of the final legs of the flight was to be from Ley, New Guinea, to an extremely small island 2,500 miles away known as Halland Island. On July 2, 1937, Earhart and Noonan were close to the island, but U.S. Coast Guard ships on standby to track the flight lost communication with Earhart's plane. One of her last transmissions to the ship stated, We must be on you, but cannot see you, but gas is running low. Have been unable to reach you by radio. We are flying at 1,000 feet. After radio transmission ceased, Amelia Earhart, Fred Noonan, and the plane were never seen or heard from again, making their disappearance one of the greatest mysteries in American history. Amelia Earhart was declared dead in January of 1939 at 41 years of age. Today, the legacy and legend of Amelia Earhart lives on at Purdue University, where there are buildings named in her honor, statues of her on display, and the world's largest collection of Earhart papers, artifacts, and memorabilia housed on university grounds. However, many believe that beyond the physical artifacts, the spirit of Amelia Earhart also makes its presence known on campus, particularly in Hangar No. 1 at the Purdue University Airport. Since her disappearance, many have reported seeing a ghostly figure resembling Earhart, with crew and maintenance workers describing the apparition as a slender woman in pants wearing an aviation jacket and scarf standing in the shadows of the hangar. Another report claims that a National Guard member was so startled by the sudden appearance of the apparition that he fired a warning shot at her. Others have also heard the sound of an old-fashioned prop engine being started from within the hangar, even though no plane of that type was inside. It seems that the famous aviatrix, who had a mysterious ending to her life, is just as mysterious in her death. While flying is considered the safest method of travel, there are, unfortunately, accidents which have occurred that have claimed a large number of lives instantly and simultaneously. On December 29, 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401, a Lockheed L-1011 TriStar plane, was traveling from New York JFK to Miami, Florida, with an experienced flight crew of 13 and 163 passengers. The captain of the flight was Bob Loft, the first officer was John Stockstill, and the flight engineer was Don Repo. 
Upon approaching landing in Miami shortly before midnight, the landing gear was lowered, but the first officer noticed that the indicator light for the gear had not illuminated to green. What follows next was a series of human errors that turned out to be fatal. Becoming preoccupied with the non-illuminating light, Captain Loft told the tower that he would go into a holding pattern at 2,000 feet over the Florida Everglades, and he instructed 2nd Officer Repo to go below the flight deck to determine if the landing gear was down, and then he instructed Stockstill to put the plane onto autopilot. The crew in the cockpit began removing the entire light assembly. After about 80 seconds, Captain Loft inadvertently switched off the autopilot when he hit the yoke, which caused the plane to slowly start descending. The plane's warning alarm sounded, but with Engineer Repo being below deck and the others being preoccupied, no one in the cockpit heard the alarm as the plane sank lower toward the ground over the pitch black Everglades. The tower controller only asked, how is everything going out there? This very innocuous statement was lost on the pilots considering the controller was actually trying to determine why the plane was losing altitude. The final transmission from the cockpit was as follows. Stock still. We did something to the altitude. Loft. What? Stock still. We're still at 2,000 feet, right? Loft. Hey, what is happening here? Ta 10 seconds later, the jetliner crashed in the Everglades, killing 101 on board. Miraculously, 75 passengers and crew members survived. During the investigation into the crash, the landing gear was found to have been fully lowered. The indicator light in the cockpit was merely a blown bulb. Human error by flight crew was determined to be the cause of this deadly crash, but if legends are to be believed, the spirits of Captain Bob Loft and Engineer Don Repo, both of whom were killed, would return to try to atone for their errors in judgment by protecting other flights. Due to the fact that the aircraft was not completely destroyed, many pieces were salvaged and recycled into other L-1011 planes. Soon after, stories from passengers and crew members on those aircraft began to emerge. For example, in 1973, it was reported that a flight crew boarding their aircraft noticed a pilot already in the cockpit. The boarding crew talked to this pilot before he completely vanished. This caused the crew to become so shaken that the flight was canceled. Not long after, a flight engineer boarded to perform his pre-flight check when he noticed the figure of Don Repo already sitting in the cockpit. Before disappearing, the apparition reportedly stated, you don't need to worry about the pre-flight, I've already done it. Weeks later, another captain was checking his instruments when a man appeared beside him and said, there will never be another crash of an L-1011, we will not let that happen. The captain recognized Don Repo's face before the figure disappeared. Also in 1973, the captain of an Eastern Airlines flight was asked to check on a passenger in first class who would not respond to flight attendant questions and who appeared to be in some sort of a coma. When the longtime Eastern Airlines captain approached the passenger, the captain recognized the passenger as his former colleague and exclaimed, My God, it's Bob Loft. The passenger then vanished. In total, there were over 20 reported sightings of Bob Loft and Don Repo, and while these stories persisted for nearly two years, so much so that a book and a movie were created about the stories, Eastern Airlines denied all of these claims. However, it seems that the reported ghost sightings stopped when Eastern Airlines quietly removed all of the reused parts of Flight 401 from other aircraft. In May of 1979, a man in Cincinnati had a vivid dream of a plane crashing upon takeoff. The man, David Booth, had the dream night after night until he was so affected that he decided to call the FAA. Expecting to be laughed at, the FAA took Booth seriously, asking him to describe the plane, the airport, and the airline. Booth told the FAA that his dream depicted an American Airlines flight taking off from a large airport. Just after taking off, Booth vividly details that the plane veers left, rolls, and then crashes into the ground. Both the FAA and American Airlines told Booth that it sounded like either a DC-10 or a Boeing 727, 
but without a tail number or an exact date, there was nothing they could do. On the night of May 24th, Booth had the dream for the last time, because May 25th brought the news that Booth had been dreading. Sitting in Chicago O'Hare's airport on May 25th was actress Lindsay Wagner, and she was waiting to board American Airlines Flight 191 to Los Angeles when she was overcome with a wave of panic and unease. She decided not to board the flight and instead switched to another. Both David Booth and Lindsay Wagner's premonitions have been documented and they are indelibly linked to the crash of American Airlines Flight 191. Flight 191 was a DC-10 that was scheduled to depart Chicago O'Hare's airport on the morning of May 25, 1979, taking a direct route to Los Angeles International Airport. The day was nice and clear, and at 3.02 p.m., the airplane, carrying 258 passengers and 13 crew members, was set for takeoff. But as it roared down the runway, the left engine detached and flipped over the top of the wing, severing several hydraulic lines and about three feet of the left wing as it fell to the ground beside of the runway. As the aircraft climbed to about 325 feet, the unbalanced plane began to veer to the left, at which point it stalled and sent the airplane into the ground, killing all on board along with two people on the ground. Following the crash, the investigation determined that improper maintenance procedures at American Airlines caused the accident. Eight weeks earlier, the maintenance crew skipped proper protocol in order to reduce time, man hours, and cost. The maintenance crew inadvertently cracked the pylon used to attach the engine to the wing, and by May 25th, the stress of that tiny crack caused the pylon to fail, which in turn caused the engine to detach from the wing resulting in one of the worst aviation disasters in U.S. history. Within hours of the crash, numerous residents in a nearby mobile home park next to the crash site reported knocking at their doors and windows, only to find that there was no one there. Within a few weeks of the crash, the knocking became more widespread, with residents also reporting knobs being turned and rattled, footsteps being heard throughout their homes, and in some cases, apparitions being seen. Several of these apparitions were reported to have inquired about missing luggage and worried about making connecting flights before vanishing into darkness. Within months after the crash, police were receiving calls from motorists who reported seeing odd, bobbing lights hovering over the crash site. Yet patrol officers found no one at the site when they went to investigate. Eventually, the ghostly sightings became less frequent, however dogs at a training facility next to the crash site still bark at something unseen, and for decades, passengers at O'Hare International have witnessed a man at a payphone next to the departure gate end a phone call, turn towards the gate, and then disappear completely. Today, the passengers and crew of Flight 191 are memorialized in a tribute wall located near the crash site, one brick for each of the 273 people killed. The wall was erected in 2011, 32 years after the crash. The funds were obtained through the efforts of the sixth grade class of Decatur Classical School of Chicago because they wanted to ensure that those lost souls would never be forgotten. Virginia Patterson Hensley was born in Westchester, Virginia in 1932, and by the age of 25, Virginia, who would become known as Patsy Cline, had a number two hit on the Billboard charts and was on her way to becoming one of the most influential vocalists of the 20th century in both country music and pop music genres. At the age of 15, the budding singer boldly wrote to the Grand Old Opry, requesting to join the cast of the show. Although she was well received during her audition, the Grand Old Opry did not grant her request. In 1953, she married Gerald E. Klein, and at the recommendation of her manager, Virginia changed her name to her stage name of Patsy. In 1954, Patsy Klein signed a contract with Four Star Records, and in 1955, she released her first album, which was largely unsuccessful. On January 18, 1957, 
Klein was given the opportunity to perform on Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scout, which was a national television show. Although Klein had another song in mind that night, the show's producer preferred that she sing Walkin' After Midnight, which Klein had recorded earlier but had not yet released it as a single. Klein's performance won over audiences that night, and due to public demand, the song was rush released as a single on February 11th. The song became Klein's breakthrough hit, and it reached number two on the country charts and number 12 on the pop charts, making Klein a crossover artist. In 1957, Klein divorced her first husband, and in 1958, she married Charlie Dick, with whom she would have two children. In 1960, the Grand Old Opry decided to revisit her 1947 request to join the show, and this time, her request was granted, making Patsy Cline the only person to gain membership to the Opry in such a manner. In 1961, Cline released the song, I Fall to Pieces, which was her first number one hit on country charts, and it also peaked at number 12 on the pop charts. However, the success of that song was curtailed by a car accident on June 14, 1961. As the second accident of Klein's life, this particular crash, a head-on collision with another vehicle, threw Klein into the windshield, causing extensive facial and life-threatening injuries. Although she survived, Klein would be scarred for the remainder of her life. Unable to capitalize on her success with I Fall to Pieces due to her hospitalization, Klein sought another song to record that would be used as a follow-up. She recorded Crazy, written by Willie Nelson, and it instantly became her signature song, again ranking high on both the country and pop charts. In 1962, Patsy Klein, who was now a powerhouse in the music industry, followed up with another smash hit with the song called She's Got You, which was her second and final number one hit. Hauntingly, in early 1963, Klein, who was only 30 years of age and a fast-rising star, began to worry her friends and family by indicating that she did not feel that she would live much longer. She finalized her will, made arrangements for her children to be cared for by friends in the event of her death, and she started giving away personal items that her friends could remember her by. Also, in February of 1963, at a party to celebrate the end of a long recording session, Klein is rumored to have held up the new record, along with a copy of her first one, and said, here it is, the first and the last. A week before her death, Klein was speaking to backup singer Ray Walker, and during their conversation reportedly stated, Honey, I've had two bad accidents. The third one will either be a charm or it will kill me. On March 3, 1963, Patsy Cline performed at a benefit concert in Kansas City, Kansas, along with Cowboy Copas and Hawkshaw Hawkins, after which she was scheduled to fly back to Nashville on March 4th, but conditions were foggy. Her friend and fellow singer, Dottie West, asked Cline to drive the 16 hours back to Nashville rather than fly. Cline decided to fly, remarking, don't worry about me, when it's my time to go, it's my time. On March 5th, Patsy Cline, along with pilot Randy Hughes and fellow performers Cowboy Copas and Hawkshaw Hawkins, left Kansas City in a Piper Comanche aircraft. They stopped briefly for fuel in Dyersburg, Tennessee, at which point the airport manager suggested that they forego flying further for the night due to poor weather conditions. Pilot Randy Hughes decided that he was okay to fly, stating, We've already come this far, we'll be there before you know it. The plane took off at 6.07 p.m., and at 6.20 p.m., the plane crashed in inclement weather in a forest just outside of Camden, Tennessee. Patsy Klein, Randy Hughes, Cowboy Copas, and Hawkshaw Hawkins were killed instantly. Today, the crash site has become a memorial to Patsy Klein, Cowboy Copas, Hawkshaw Hawkins, and Randy Hughes, with a winding path leading down to where the actual wreckage was found. Many visitors to the site feel uneasy as they descend down this path, and others also describe feeling odd or chilled when standing where the wreckage was found. 
Others have reported that pet dogs begin to whine and refuse to go near the inscription boulder which sits at the end of the path. Many believe that the ghost of Patsy Cline still lingers at the crash site, and many others believe that her spirit haunts the Ryman Auditorium, the former home of the Grand Old Opry. Despite her short life and career, Patsy Cline continues to set records to this day. In 1973, she became the first female artist inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame, and Patsy Cline's greatest hits, released four years after her death, is one of the all-time best-selling country records of all time by a female artist, with over 14 million records sold to date. Whether a ghost or not, it seems that the singer, who had a voice which was described as haunting, also had a spirit that will forever live on through her music. A natural extension of aviation is space exploration, and in 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, became responsible for the civilian space program, as well as aeronautics and space research. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy committed to land a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s, and this, in turn, established the Apollo program, which ran from 1961 to 1972. In 1967, a three-person flight crew, designated AS-204, or simply Apollo 1, was planned to launch from Florida's Cape Canaveral on February 21st of that year and was to be the first ever crewed test flight of an Apollo command module. The three men chosen for the crew were command pilot Gus Grissom, senior pilot Ed White, and pilot Roger Chaffee. The Apollo Command Module was the most complex than any previous module, and testing indicated that safety design flaws could be present. For example, the interior of the capsule contained a large amount of flammable material about which the crew expressed their concerns. Also, it is reported that Gus Grissom was so exasperated with the unsolved technical issues that he and his fellow crew members sent a picture of themselves praying over a model of the capsule and sent it to the head of the Apollo program with the note reading, it is not that we don't trust you, but this time we've decided to go over your head. Additionally, the internal atmosphere of the capsule was mandated to be made of pure oxygen, which presented an extreme fire hazard, and a tightly sealed inward opening hatch that required a ratchet to release six bolts individually was the only way into and out of the capsule. On January 26, 1967, the backup crew, which included astronaut Wally Shira, sat inside of the capsule for a plug-in test that had the capsule dependent upon electrical power from the ground and the hatch door left open. After emerging, Wally Shira told his longtime friend Gus Grissom, if you get the slightest glitch, get out of there. I don't like it. One day later, on January 27th, Grissom, White, and Chaffee were to perform a plugs-out test in which the capsule, sitting on top of a Saturn rocket, would be detached from all ground cables and to be tested solely on internal power. The crew was taken to Launch Pad 34 and prepared to enter the capsule. Upon entering the capsule, Grissom noted a smell like sour buttermilk, but no cause was found, so the test continued, with the hatch sealed and the astronauts locked inside. A communications glitch kept Grissom's mic open, to which he stated, how are we supposed to get to the moon if we can't talk between two or three buildings? But how are we going to get to the moon if we can't talk between two or three buildings? Several seconds later, the crew began yelling fire, then there was a scream, and then all transmission ceased. The fire was determined to have started somewhere under Grissom's seat, with the cause believed to have been unprotected wiring. The fire roared through the capsule due to the pure oxygen, and the men could not escape due to the poor hatch design, which, during earlier practice sessions, took Ed White nearly two minutes to open because each of the six bolts had to be ratcheted before released. All three men died from asphyxia within 19 seconds of the start of the fire. 
Cape Canaveral's Launch Pad 34 was in use until 1968, and then it was deactivated with the rocket tower and other structures being removed. The launch platform was left, however, and today serves as a memorial to the crew of Apollo 1. Besides the large structure of concrete, however, many feel that the spirits of Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee also remain, with visitors and former employees reporting unusual occurrences at the site. While NASA has never publicly commented, many visitors have reported hearing screams coming from the monument, while others have left the area due to a feeling of dread or sadness. Others have also reported seeing floating apparitions around the platform as well. If the lore is to be believed, it seems that the spirits of three men who lived their lives in exploration of the final frontier have remained behind to haunt their final place on Earth. Prior to human flight, the sky was seen as reserved for birds, angels, and deities, with man being physically prohibited from soaring above the ground. However, the invention of gliders, balloons, airplanes, and rockets literally propelled men over the obstacles of Earth and instilled a feeling of godlike control over the natural constraints that tether man to the ground. For mankind, flying became possible due to the belief in possibilities and the belief that the impossible could be achieved. As man soars higher and higher in order to reach new frontiers, the gap separating heaven and earth becomes smaller. And when contemplating the legends and lore surrounding flight accidents, it seems that the space separating the impossible from the possible is not as vast as it once appeared. <laughs>